Hey, this is Dr. Bustai, and welcome to another session where we'll be covering some core pharmacology. We're going to be diving a little deeper into a very specific uh, clinical scenario and question related to the use of furosemide um, IV over using it by mouth in patients with um, CHF exacerbations. So let's start off with a little bit of a case. This is a 55-year-old male with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, known heart failure with an ejection fraction of approximately 20%, who comes in with progressively worsening shortness of breath, uh, dyspnea exertion, lower extremity edema extending all the way up into the thighs, um, and a 10-pound weight gain over the past week. He reports being compliant and taking his diuretics but he says that his urine output has decreased. When you look at his medications, he's on the classic medications for all of these conditions, including glycinopril, which is your ACE inhibitor, metoprolol succinate, which is topol XL, FDA approved for heart failure, furosemide um, twice a day by mouth, atorvastatin or Lipitor for his cholesterol, and then insulin based on his um, sugar levels. Vital signs are stable, but his O2SAT is a little on the lower side of the normal at room uh, on room air. Uh, he does look visibly short of breath, um, and when you look at him and uh, you see that he has edema in his lower extremities, you identify it to being three plus. Um, you also, when you listen to and auscultate his lungs, you can hear that there are bilateral rails um, present and some JVD. On x-ray, he has evidence of basically fluid overload, pulmonary vascular congestion, he has cardiomegaly, which is consistent with his heart failure and some evidence of mild pulmonary edema. So he's started on IV. He's given um, IV Lasix instead of giving it by mouth. And we'll do strict I's and O's, which is intake and output, and then measure daily weights. And the patient is admitted to the hospital for basically diuresis. So the clinical scenario or question then raised, to be raised is why are we giving and why do we always tend to give the loop diuretics by intravenous infusions or IV push uh, instead of giving it by mouth when patients come in with fluid volume overload in the context of uh, heart failure exacerbations. Well, to be able to answer that question, we do need to step back and make sure that your core knowledge is intact, okay? Yeah, you have to understand how the drug works. And if the and you have to understand how that if that drug doesn't get to its site of action, then it won't work. And that goes to the answer to this question. So when we refer to loop diuretics, we're actually talking about the four um, diuretics that are available. That is bumetanide or bumex, uh, furosemide or Lasix, um, and then you have torsemide or demodex and etherclinic acid. Which for the most part, I may ignore etherclinic acid because it's not only not very commonly used in practice, but it's also near impossible to find. So we'll be focusing on the main loop diuretics. Obviously, this question is about furosemide. Now, when you look at the normal uh, anatomy of the kidney, um, it's important to recognize that there are key components to it. Um, we have the outside portion, which is really the cortex of the kidney, and then we have the inner part here, which is the medulla. Um, the medulla represents where, not only, not only, and the cortex represents where the nephrons are found, which we're going to zoom in here in a second, but all those things collect basically urine filtrate from the collecting tubules, which will eventually empty into the ureter to go to your bladder and elimination um, as urine. But let's zoom in into that cortex and uh, the medulla. So if you look up here, this is our, our, our cortex up here, and this is the medulla over here, and we have nephrons that are present in there surrounded by a lot of blood vessels because they need to be perfused. Um, you can see here that we have a nephron, in the, which is the glomerulus on the proximal renal tubule is present here. Then we have the loop of Henle down here, and then we have the ascending loop of Henle distal convoluted tubule, and then a collecting duct where it eventually empties out into the ureter for renal elimination. So let's take a moment and let's zoom in at the glomerulus because it's really important that you understand that in order for these drugs to work, they have to get inside of the lumen of the nephron. They work on the luminal side of the, of the tubule, not the basolateral side. So here's the luminal side of the nephron at the proximal renal tubule. And this is the basolateral side, which is where the blood vessels and predominantly come. So when you look, when you administer a loop diuretic IV or by mouth, 
it has to get from the blood side, which is the basal lateral side, uh, uses an or organic anion transporter to do that, and it gets put into the urine filtrate. Okay, so there's a lot of things going in the urine filtrate, sodium and glucose and chloride and potassium, all these other things. Uh, but you have to recognize that the loop diuretic that makes it inside of the cell, if it doesn't get to the site of transport into the proximal renal tubule, it will not work. That's really important. Now, once it's in the urine filtrate, okay, that's present up here, it's going to go down into the loop of Henle here and then enter into the ascending loop of Henle. And let's zoom in to that area. And you can see that the uh, urine filtrate is heading up the ascending loop of Henle. Um, and, and it goes to the thick ascending portion where there's the sodium potassium 2 chloride transporter, which is where loop diuretics work. They block this transporter and block about 20 to up to 40% of sodium and water reabsorption, which is one of the reasons why it contributes to the diuretic effect. So that sodium and, and water then stay in the urine filtrate and they move on to the distal convoluted tubule um, and then eventually into the collecting duct for elimination. So what do we know about the absorption of furosemide uh, or Lasix? Well, we know that if you just take the totality of the information and the evidence, which I provide re references here because I think it's very important that we integrate the evidence in its proper context into these answers. Okay, it's not just enough to know the basic facts, but you understand where that stuff comes from and that it's based off of some sort of evidence. So in the overall assessment, we know that absorption is very erratic. It has a very large amount of interpatient variability as well as a large amount of intrapatient variability. And the question is, why is that? Well, there are a number of factors that specifically influence furosemide, but also have an impact on other loop diuretics, but we're going to be focusing predominantly on furosemide in here. The first is the presence of food. By ingesting or taking the medicine with food, it has a significant impact on the absorption of that drug. Uh, the increasing pH or the more alkaline the environment is, the lower the amount that's going to be absorbed. The rate of gastric emptying, okay, so how fast it moves from the stomach into the intestine so that it can be absorbed to generate peak concentrations. Well, that's decreased, especially if there's a reduction in gastric emptying. That, like in our patient who has diabetes, where they're prone to gas diabetic gastroparesis, we can see that, which can then cause variability in the response. Changes in the gastrointestinal surface area. Let's say they have a, a portion of their intestine taken out or something happened and it's damaged as a result of some other medical process going on. What about the GI uh, tract integrity? So that, this could be even edematous bowel from fluid overload and heart failure or very inflamed bowel. And then lastly, gastrointestinal perfusion. In the context of heart failure, the heart is pumping blood to vital organs, one of those being the kidneys, the other being your gut. So you have to have good tissue perfusion in order to take drug from that site and then take it to where it needs to go. So how do these factors impact furosemide being used orally and how does it compare to other agents? Well, this table summarizes the three main Loop diuretics, furosemide, bumetanide, and torsemide. We're going to talk about furosemide first, but then I'll compare it to the other agents. But when you look at the normal patient, okay, and the oral bioavailability, it's only about 50 to 70%. That means 30 to 50% of the drug never makes it into the body. And that's in the normal patient with normal anatomy, normal perfusion, normal pHs, all that stuff, and taking it on an empty stomach. When you compare that to its use in patients with heart failure, we see that the overall bioavailability, which is the amount that eventually always makes it into the body, is not really changed significantly. But what is changed and is very important to the efficacy of it is that we decrease the rate of its absorption, which also then reduces the peak concentrations that make it to the kidney to exert the diuretic effect. Now, we can overcome this by increasing the dose or by increasing the concentration and the delivery of the drug to that nephron so that it can get into that renal tubule and then work on that channel that we were talking about. But when you look at, I apologize, when you look at here bumetanide, you see that bumetanide has a much better bioavailability but is also impacted 
by the rate of absorption as well as the peak concentrations. Lastly, torsamide here, which has a higher bioavailability and is not impacted by some of those things in heart failure, is one of the reasons why some clinicians prefer torsamide in heart failure patients because it actually has improved absorption and the rate of absorption even despite the patient being fluid overload. And interestingly, the dose IV and PO is roughly the same, whereas with furosemide, it's usually that the IV equivalent is about half because of the bioavailability. So pulling this all together, why do we preferentially administer Lasix IV versus giving it by mouth in patients with heart failure exacerbations? Well, giving it IV ensures that we get 100% bioavailability. We are infusing it into the central circulation. Instead of getting 50 to 70% of it absorbed, we get 100% of the concentration in the patient's body. This removes the influence of gastric acid environment, the presence of food, the degree of gastric motility and emptying, and the rate of dissolution and absorption into that bowel and whether it's compromised or not. And this then impacts the peak concentrations that are provided to that nephron. Why does that matter? Because it now allows us to get rid of that fluid and start diuresis earlier than what we would have been able to achieve with higher doses of oral. That then allows us to try to turn the heart failure exacerbation around to encourage forward flow, which will then increase perfusion to organs. And going back, we care about the gastrointestinal tract. So we increase the perfusion back to that so that when we do convert them to oral, we can start absorbing it and distribute it to the kidneys. And then once it makes it to the kidneys in higher concentrations, right, we only have the delivery of the drug, but we are perfusing that kidney, which increases urine filtrate production and that overall diuresis and the patient feels better, can be converted back to oral and is sent home. And that is why we give patients preferentially IV over PO in the context of acute heart failure exacerbations where there is evidence of fluid overload. That is the reason. As I've always said before, and and it's key to this whole discussion. Keep learning fun, easy to understand, clinically relevant, based on the evidence, and most importantly, oriented to the patients that you've been given the privilege to serve. I hope that helps put things into context and that your knowledge is now deeper than it was before.